back to the hunter's home. She thinks she's a reason for me to think that well, way, but she just. Pretty sure she had. Oh, no, no. For here in the fish shop. 
Before December. <laughs> GCBA or that has a um, film. Yeah, or if you get on their website, they have they do a bunch of crunching in of ethics and stuff like that at the last the last two months. But it was an interesting experience. I mean, I was more intrigued by it. Like in the morning from seven thirty to eight thirty, so people can go on to work or they'll do lunch things. 
Hi, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, you got that right. Two years later? Sixty years later? Yeah, that would have been sixty years. Yeah, I've run into it just a couple of times. How are you? It's been nice to see you. Thank you for being everybody. Less well than she is. City, Boise, Idaho, and West. And of course, uh, okay. Okay. And, Do you still uh, have a place in Vegas? In uh, 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 Idaho? Well, the family's ranch. You know, I, I oh, okay. Did, I but, eat it. It was delicious. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That moving back and forth it just sucks. You know, so we're, oh, yeah. so we're, we're just living here. Yeah, let me go back to the place. You want to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I probably don't spend Absolutely. six nights of the year there. I mean, no. you, oh, you, you still have the house there? there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was my mom and dad's house. I mean, it belongs to the ranch. Mm -hmm. really oh, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the ranch so, house. The ranch okay. house, yeah. So, but as far as uh, now, you know, her two sons moved to Boise with us. And they stayed there? Both joy, and they love it. And they stayed there. Everything you want. So, uh, you know, remember what a great time it was to go to that, uh, you know, that, uh, Oh, my I have um, got all more involved back with my business school. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, 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 one, two, testing. And our foundation, okay. mom and dad play back. Yeah, they're all fucking on the Oh, the, the microphone? I'm going to actually get the license. Yeah. 
I don't even know how. You just. Uh -oh. Hello? <laughs> welcome. Welcome, everyone, on this beautiful homecoming weekend. Welcome to the College of Law. My name is Janet Levitt. I'm the Dean of the College of Law. And I'm just going to briefly introduce our event and then turn it over to our speaker. So, institutions like the university, like the University of Tulsa College of Law, are really as strong as their history and their roots. And from those roots grow our present and our future. And so we established a few years ago this alumni showcase series to really help us discover our roots, help us discover our alumni, and to bring many of our alumni and friends of the law school to the building um, periodically to learn about how the College of Law has shaped our alumni's careers. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce Bill Carmody as uh, the featured speaker today in our alumni showcase series. And I will say that you have the list of the rest of our speakers for the year in front of you. Bill was a 19... 88 graduate of the College of Law, and he has built, since graduating, a truly impressive career that was rooted in excellence and a clear passion for litigation practice. From TU, he went to Fulbright and Jaworski uh, in Dallas. Then he opened his own firm, where I believe he did some significant plaintiff's work. Then he joined the Sussman Godfrey 
law firm uh, in Dallas. Now he leads up the New York office. For those of you who are familiar with boutique litigation firms, Sussman Godfrey is always on the list of the top of the top. Bill has been elected a Texas super lawyer, a New York super lawyer. Here's a new category I hadn't heard of, a law dragon, uh, top 500 list, and also the top 100 list of securities litigators. He is truly one of a handful of lawyers that CEOs go to in this country when they have a make or break case, or he calls it a bet your company case. He uh, appears frequently on television commenting on his cases, and his victories have been featured in prominent national publications, including the National Law Journal, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the American Lawyer. And before I turn this over, I will say that we also are very pleased that President Upham um, is joining us today uh, for, for this lecture. Um, I had really the great pleasure of having lunch with Bill a few months ago in New York City. In addition to being a terrific lawyer, he is warm, charismatic, a true connoisseur of food and wine, and his wife Catherine joins us today who is a 1994 graduate of the College of Law. So with that, I turn it over to Bill Carmody. Thank you, Dean. I am blown away. Uh, I love Tulsa, and it's incredible being back here. And I cannot believe all the changes in the campus. And even this little courtroom here where we're sitting now, it was a courtroom when I was here, but it looked nothing like this. I had my first year property class in this courtroom, and I remember vividly uh, wondering, does anybody understand the rule against perpetuities? And now, about 25 or so years later, I can tell you definitively the answer is no. <laughs> Except for Rex of Dallas, that is. I love seeing so many engaged, friendly faces versus the not so uh, engaged faces I, I often see in juries. And I thought what I'd do today is share a few of the things I've learned in trying lawsuits and how to influence those not so engaged juries. Great trial lawyers persuade. But before you persuade others, you've got to be able to connect with them. And to connect with people, you've got to open up and be yourself and overcome the fear we all have of rejection. It's all a part, it's about being real, being authentic, being comfortable in your own skin, embracing your own uniqueness, and speaking from the heart. Being comfortable enough to share your private feelings with others. And that's how you get others, like jurors, to open up and share with you. I learned this essential truth from one of America's great stand-up jury lawyers, Jerry Spence. It's only after you first bear yourself can you learn what a jury panel really thinks. Now, as I say it, it seems so fundamental to me how to become a great jury lawyer and the fundamental prerequisite there. But it's something uh, that's easier said than done and something I had to learn the hard way. My failure to bear myself uh, to a jury panel in a high-profile case is now etched in my brain. It was a case that the National Law Journal lauded as the trial of the year. But I had the dubious distinction of being on a losing side of that case. It was a case in where I represented a big group of plaintiffs who all had one thing in common. While they were teenagers, they were treated in psychiatric hospitals. And I use the term treated loosely. They were subjected to inhumane treatment and they were kept there, not because of medical necessity, but because they had insurance. And as soon as their insurance ran, they were discharged. And the inhumane treatment they suffered, I mean, they were in solitary, uh, shock therapy, bound by restraints. It was a case, while it had some legal challenges, it was a case I thought we won. I thought we won right up until the jury verdict. Then the jury comes back and pours us out a finding of no liability whatsoever. And then in jury debriefing, 
I start talking to the jurors for the first time, and I realize something so basic, that a big reason for the loss is the jurors just didn't like my clients. And as I thought about it, I totally understood because I didn't like them either. <laughs> you might say, "What's you know? Why weren't they likable?" Well, I was representing them when they were probably in their young twenties, but they had gone through the psychiatric hospital experience as teens. They were angry people, uh, antisocial tendencies, self-absorbed. They just weren't easy people to like. And when I tried that case, I had to yet befriend Jerry Spence. And so, as much as I thought I knew, I didn't grasp the necessity of bearing myself, revealing my own feelings, in order to get the jury panel to reveal, the, to reveal theirs. In this elaborate voir dire I did, I think I talked about everything in his son, everything except my own feelings toward my clients. In a do-over, I confess right up front to the jury panel, I find it hard to like my clients. Being open, being candid, and suggesting they may come to feel the same way. Experiences taught me had I done that. Hands would have gone up, jurors would have started confronting my opinion, taking my client's side and wondering why weren't they likable which would have then allowed me to embrace the problem I had right up front in jury selection where I had some control over the dialogue and where I could plant seeds that my client's angry dispositions may be linked to their stays in these psychiatric hospitals versus failing to foreshadow why my client's demeanors were the way they were and leaving it for jurors to confront their dislike of my clients for the very first time in jury deliberations when I wasn't around. I attribute that lesson, that single lesson, as fundamental to my success before jurors today. But it's also losses like that that make you, make you pause, make you wonder and go, my goodness, do I really want to be doing this? Is this a little too tough on the tummy? And the truth is, I love being a lawyer now, but it wasn't always that way. And like so many young lawyers, I was disillusioned early on. Um, I left TU, it was 88, and I went to a big firm, and I think then it was the biggest firm in Texas, Fulbright and Jaworski. And it's a great firm, it was a great firm then, great firm now, and it's produced so many of America's great trial lawyers, but for me, I wasn't comfortable there. I wasn't comfortable in the big firm environment and the lockstep pace of progression. I had skipped a few years between undergrad and TU, um, probably, I think about four, something like that. I had a life for a couple years as a marine engineer, and then I was in a restaurant and bar business where I had way too much fun. And so by the time I got to Fulbright, I was about four years, I guess, older than my classmates. And I just didn't kind of fit in with that pecking order, kind of waiting online, your turn, writing research memos and, you know, research and writing. And so I think I liked the status of being a Fulbright associate, but I didn't like the day-to-day -day reality. I wasn't living like the boss I thought I was. So after three and a half years, I gave myself a battlefield promotion to partner by leaving Fulbright and starting my own firm. To go, you know, I mean, I wanted to go chase my dreams, try lawsuits, go make the big bucks. The way it's depicted on TV, at least the way I thought it was supposed to be. And I ran my own firm for about eight or so years. And it was there I tried all different types of lawsuits. And I realized more than anything, I love trying lawsuits. This is what I love to do. And people have asked me, you know, what's your first big hit? Did you have a, a first big win? The answer is yes. Uh, it was a case about 15 or so years ago where I hit Chevron. It was a jury verdict for $61 million. And it was a case in which I used, I actually used so many of the principles I learned right here in Mary Ann Blair's civil procedure class. Uh, the, the setup for the case is when I got retained, I got retained to represent a small contractor who did work in refineries while they were shut down, construction work. And the work they did in this case was at Chevron's El Paso refinery. 
but a dispute arose between this contractor and Chevron when the contractor's workers were coming down with these illnesses. They were working inside crude towers and came out with rashes and respiratory problems because they were exposed to sulfur dioxide. Chevron would say, hey, we tested those towers. The levels were fine. Get your guys back in there. But the workers would go back in and come back out with the same problems. Finally, the contractor said, listen, I'm not putting my men back in those towers unless and until OSHA comes out and gives, you, you know, gives, gives us a clean bill of health here. Well, it costs a whole lot of money for these plants to be shut down every day, so Chevron had a better idea. They locked out my, my guy's crew. They locked everyone out completely and just replaced them with brand new contractors. That's what happened. And so what the dispute was about was how much money my contractor was due for the work he did before he got locked out of the plant. Chevron said it was nothing because the quantity and quality of your work was insufficient and the other guys who came in here and replaced you had to redo most of it. The first important move we made in that case was shoring up favorable venue. You've all heard the old adage, marketing 101 is play to your audience. Well, I'm here to tell you trial law 101 is find your best audience. And that's because different juries view the same facts differently. I mean, think of, think of a jury in Omaha, Nebraska, and how you might present your case to them and how they may view it, and then think in your mind how a jury in San Francisco, California, might react to those very same facts. I believe we all have a fiduciary duty to our clients to find the very best forum for their case. And in this old Chevron case here, the dispute arose, well, let me tell you the statute then, it's since been repealed, it's an old Texas statute that let you sue foreign companies like Chevron, who's a California company, let you sue them anywhere, any county in Texas where they had a representative. And so all the natural venue in this case was El Paso because that was the plant in which everything happened. I sued Chevron almost a thousand miles away in Beaumont, Texas because Chevron had a plant in Beaumont and they had just laid off a few thousand workers. And for those of you who don't know Beaumont, it's a heck of it's a great, you know, it's a blue collar town known for its plaintiff's juries. But the trick of course was keeping Chevron in state court in Beaumont and that was done by destroying diversity, adding a, a Texas company, a non-diverse company, who, uh, or a diverse company, uh, who uh, did the crude tower cleaning and then using the old year and a day rule, dismissing them after a year had gone by when it was too late for Chevron to remove that case to federal court, so I stuck them in state court in Beaumont. And then the fun began by turning what was a simple contract case into a tort case. The key was developing a fraud claim because what I wanted to do is render relevant Chevron's callous attitude toward worker safety and show them some exposure from punitive damages from that possibility. But the problem I had was one of standing. In other words, I had some injured workers who certainly could have their own injury claims against Chevron, but they weren't parties to this suit. I was representing their employer, the contractor. And so my challenge was to think, well, was the contractor, did they suffer some injury by way of the injuries to the workers? And the eureka moment came when I realized, yes, these workers' injuries caused the contractor's workers' comp premiums to increase. So I realized I could state a fraud claim, and then, as you might imagine, the story I told the trial didn't dwell on the unpaid work, but was built around Chevron's greed and why they misrepresented the work conditions in the refinery. And then what I did is I turned the courtroom into a theater where I played out this drama of big company greed on one hand versus worker safety on the other. And I wanted to get the jurors interested in the case and understanding of what happened out at the refinery. So what I did is, since so much of the activity, the key activity revolved around these crude towers, I had a full-size crude tower, actually a quarter, a cross-section it was, quarter scale of a crude tower built and put in the courtroom. We had a courtroom with ceilings as high as this, maybe a little bit higher. 
and it, the, the tower was so big, it, was, had, it had to be assembled actually inside the courtroom. And it, I was lucky then to have a, a, a client who was a contractor who could build all this and build it all to scale. But I did that to get the jury interested in, when we did the demonstrations, they could get into the case, they could understand the case, they were all part of the game. And to move the case along as fast as I possibly could to keep the jury interested in the case, I tried what's called a paperless trial. One of the very first in Texas, if not the first. And when you say, what's a paperless trial? If you watch any trial, you know, with the ones we've all seen and watched on TV, what happens? Well, someone hands, the lawyer wants to introduce a document into evidence, takes the document, gives a courtesy copy to opposing counsel, takes another copy of the document, asks the court first, can I approach the witness? Yes. Walk up there and hand a copy of the document to the witness, have the witness review the document. <coughs> lay a foundation for that document, and then offer that document into evidence. You see how boring that process is? You're losing the jury, of course, during that process. So what I did is I got all the documents pre-admitted, and the way I did that is on the pretrial hearing, I knew, of course, all the documents I wanted to introduce into evidence. I had the court rule on them, and after the court ruled, and as soon as opening statements are done and the trial begins, I offered them in bulk. So all the documents are now in. And once they're in, documents and evidence, you can do anything you want with it. And to move as fast as I wanted to move and keep the jury in the game. I had a big movie size, movie theater size screen, eight foot screen on the other side. In other words, that the jury box is behind me, the screens over there. They need to, like a movie theater, enjoy the depth perception of the courtroom. You've been in these modern courtrooms that have the monitors. Each jury has his own TV. Forget it. Don't ever do that. You bring your own screen. And the computer operator that sat behind me, we, we had all kinds. All the hot documents are in there, photographs, demonstratives. We had news clips from the El Paso, you know, what happened, blah, blah, blah. They're all in there. And so then, when I want to question a witness about a document, Let's put up as Exhibit 71. Let's go right to the second paragraph. Would you highlight that second sentence? You're moving fast. You're not wasting time offering anything, and the jury's in the game. They're watching everything with you. But just to balance the use of this big screen, and so the jury wouldn't have to look at that all trial long and nothing else, I also had phone boards, the old-fashioned phone boards and easels for timelines, for example, or whenever uh, you should always have a key player's chart in any sort of a complicated case to let the juries know who the witnesses are, I mean with pictures of them and names underneath, so they could follow everything. The whole point of this was to create an interactive experience to get the jury understanding and interested in your case. So they could see here how Chevron chose to do what it did, all to keep this project on budget. This high-tech trial served an essential purpose. It let us be better at an art form that's been around since mankind learned to speak. Storytelling. And storytelling more than anything else is what makes great jury lawyers. Before you can tell your story, though, to a jury persuasively, you got to really get to know your client. You got to really step into your client's shoes. You've seen, I mean, I remember as a young lawyer, you know, clients coming in the office, small personal injury case, they have their medicals, they tell you about the collision they've been in, and they tell you about the effects of the back surgery they had and what, and what they can do. But it's never good enough to think that you can understand what they went through and be in a position to convey that to the jury unless and until you've really stepped into their shoes and you say, what does that mean? <clears throat> Consider sleeping over their house. Consider living their life with them for a day to understand really what they're going through. You know how we take so many things for granted, reaching into a cabinet to get a coffee cup out in the morning to, for your morning coffee. But what if you're sleeping over their house and you get to the morning table with them and you watch, and it turns out your client can't do that because of the lumbar surgery and the residual effects. They just can't do it. And so their spouse has to open up the cabinet just to get out a simple coffee cup. That's my point. 
in a business case, I had a business case years ago where the client was a big distributor, bought product from manufacturers and then resold it. Well, got a big bunch of inventory in from a manufacturer, it was damaged. The dispute arose because the manufacturer wouldn't take it back. Clients telling me about all sorts of business disruption and how it's really killing his business. And, you know, he brought me photographs. I could see the warehouse. I had conference calls with people at the warehouse and the client. But I could never be in a position to explain to a jury the business disruption that that client is going through until I got myself on an airplane, went out to the warehouse in California, and actually saw it. Was right there talking to the workers, watching them as they're trying to fulfill orders with all this other inventory in their way. That's the way it has to be. And when you tell your story to a jury, of course you want to use themes, themes that are going to resonate with the jury panel. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, but what's a theme and why is that so important with a jury? Let me start with the latter proposition. Why theming is so important? When we hear complex facts for the first time, our brain does two things. The first thing is on a conscious level, we're trying to memorize what we're hearing. But on a subconscious, a subconscious level, we're relating what we're hearing to home truths, principles, concepts, things that we already understand. Because we're all motivated to maintain our long-held attitudes. And think about your political beliefs. I'm not going to sit here today and convince you to change your political beliefs. We all favor information that supports or is consistent with our long-held attitudes, and we all resist information that's inconsistent with those long-held attitudes. And so theming, the concept of theming is nothing more than taking your case facts and organizing them around the jurors' principles, home truths, things that they already accept because the jurors are going to be making sense of your case through their own experiences. And that's why the best themes are those that are known to a lot of people, like you get what you pay for, or uh, we're all responsible for our own actions. Those are common themes that work in a lot of cases. And you should think about and consider trying to visualize your themes to the jury panel, especially in complex cases. It was a, I'll give you an example of a patent infringement case I tried a few years back. Fundamentally, the right of a patent owner, or patent holder, is the right to prevent others from using that invention, even if, even if the patent owner is not using the invention of him or herself. You get to prevent others from using it. It's a legal monopoly. And it sounds easy as I stand here and say that. But it's a little tough for a jury panel sometimes to really understand that and, and really deal with it, especially where the plaintiff in the patent case is not someone who's actually using the invention, but a company we call a patent troll, a company who buys patents for profit, usually a shell company, and goes out and sues infringers. And a lot of times those infringers are people who are actually using the invention themselves. And so when you get into a, a jury trial situation, it's tough sometimes for these jurors to understand this whole right to exclude that patent law provides when you have a troll as a plaintiff suing an operating company who's actually doing, you know, using the invention, like a Google, for example. And I understood that challenge, and so a couple years ago when I tried a big patent case out in rural East Texas, I analogized patent rights on one hand with landowners' rights on the other. Because I knew jurors out there appreciated a landowner's right to exclude others from his or her property, even if that property is not yet developed. And so in my opening statement to the jury in that case, behind me I have the big screen, and like an anchor man, as I'm speaking, the first slide is a nice scenic picture of an undeveloped piece, you know, rural scenic property out in East Texas. 
The next slide is the same picture, but this time it's got big tire tracks going through. It's signifying there's a trespass, so they're developing the property. And then I empowered the jurors, of course, to be sheriffs and go police those infringing trespassers. When you tell your story to the jury, you got to think of how can I tell it in a way that's going to get the jurors to react most favorably to my witnesses. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's fine in life to show emotion in the courtroom, but one emotion you should never let your witnesses show is anger at the other side. Every client, every would-be plaintiff that walks into your office is angry because somebody ripped, you know, ripped them off and they're mad at the world, and every defendant feels the same way because they just got sued in a frivolous lawsuit. And if you let them, what they're all going to do is get into the courtroom, and they're going to show that anger from the witness stand. What's the problem with that? It may steal the jury's thunder. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, before any of us in life are angry, what are we first before we're angry? We're hurt. That's why we get angry. Somebody hurt us. And if you really understand that simple principle, you have your witness on a stand and your questions, answers, and you stop with the witness being hurt. If the jurors are bonding with your witness, guess what happens? They're angry. They get angry because somebody hurt witness that they bonded with. And so as like a protective big brother, the jury then is going to hold the other side responsible. Finally, the last thing I'll say about storytelling is that you should always attempt to exploit the element of surprise in your story. It's obviously easier to do in a criminal case and harder with all the pretrial discovery in a civil case, but you can still do it. And the last war story I'll tell you is one where um, I exploited, I guess you'd say, the element of surprise and caught the other side off guard by kind of rearranging, if you will, the court's docket. It was a case where years ago I was hired to defend a Dallas investment banking company who had been sued for 50 plus million dollars by one of the co-founders of the company. And the co-founder said, oh, I've been cheated out of a dividend. We hired the then dean of St. Mary's Law School down in San Antonio in Texas, Barbara Davi, and she looked at the shareholder distribution at issue and said, that can't be a dividend for all these legal reasons, it's just impossible. But that, of course, was the, the plaintiff's central theory of the case, that that shareholder distribution was a dividend. And so then when a discovery dispute arose, when the plaintiff was going to take Barbara L. Davi's deposition, and he stormed out, so he never understood exactly what she was going to say, what her opinion was, and the basis for it, he was in a tough position because, watch what happens, let's fast forward to trial. Trial starts Monday. We're down in small Aransas County, Texas, the second smallest county in the state, just inside Corpus. And in the Friday before the Monday, I realize we're the number two case on the docket. And what you'll realize when you get out of law school is that courts, just like airlines, they overbook because most cases settle. And all we knew about this number one case was that it was a three-party case. It was kind of a grudge match. Nobody wanted to pay money to anybody else. They all thought they deserved money. So it wasn't going to settle. But if that happened, if that number one case didn't settle, the effect of that on us being number two means we're going to be reset. We're going to be reset for three, four, five, six months later. And in that interim period, the plaintiff's going to have a chance to go get the deposition of Barbara L. Dobby that he didn't get in the first place. So I'm going to lose my element of surprise. So we did something the weekend before trial that nobody had ever done before. We brokered a settlement of the number one case. I had the, I had the docket sheet from the court, and I had the, you know, the lawyer's phone numbers of that number one case. And I called him, and I'm in my hotel. You know, We had a whole slew of rooms in this hotel in Corpus. And I conducted kind of a mini mediation where I made all the lawyers and that number one case come by, and I remember there were three of them. And they came in separately, kind of pitched their case, and I'm due 100,000, you know, bull, you know, 
I got them down to the bottom number. You know, you take 50, 50, had the client show up, look, here's your 50 next. And I did that three times all told. I paid 180 grand of the client's money. But what we did is we cleared the decks. We removed the number one case. And so I wish you could have been there Monday morning. Monday in, in most state courts in Texas on trial Mondays, their first thing is you hear announcements. And the courtroom's filled. And there's almost as many people as in here now, lots of lawyers, lots of clients. And the number one case gets up, and the three lawyers all say, settled, settled, settled. And there's a silence in the courtroom. Even the judge was shocked. And so when the plaintiff in the number two case, my opponent stood up and announced, not ready, he thought I was going to do the same thing. That didn't happen. And so the court put us to trial at a time when I don't think the plaintiff was quite ready to go to trial. And he certainly wasn't ready for Barbara L. Davi's opinion. And so we won the trial, and the jury's debriefing confirmed the importance of her opinion to their verdict. Guys, it's moments like that. It's, it's, it's wins like that that, at least for a minute, make you feel like you're on top of your game. But for me, after that minute passed, I realized I love trying lawsuits. I love running cases. But I didn't love running my own law firm as much. And so when one of America's great trial firms came calling, I didn't just listen. I mean, I jumped. And it's been the best professional move I've ever made. I'm a partner now, as the dean said, at Sussman Godfrey. We are the first trial boutique in America. And you think of the big full service firms like, a, you know, in town a Hall Estill that they have all the different departments, real estate, tax, corporate, et cetera. Well, all we are is trial lawyers. And the sort of cases we try are typically big, complex business cases where one company is suing another company for hundreds of millions or sometimes billions of dollars. A lot of them are what they call venture company cases where the case is so important to that client that they lose the case, they may lose their company. We have, I think we have about 90 lawyers now in five cities. We're headquartered out of Houston, but we have offices in LA and Seattle on the West Coast. We have a Dallas office and we have a New York office. And I've often analogized the big firms, you know, to the Navy and Sussman Godfrey to the SEALs because we're a small group of people, ultra competitive men and women. The hours we work are kind of sick, uh, crazy hours, but we're trained to try any type of case. But most of the stuff we do is big business litigation. We try anything that moves. First Amendment, uh, antitrust securities, oil and gas. I mean, my partner, Steve Sussman, just two weeks ago, was trying a high-profile divorce case you may have read about in the sports pages. The, he was representing the owner of the LA Dodgers, Frank McCord, against Jamie, who David Boyes represented. But we do, you know, in two weeks, I'm trying a high-profile divorce case in New York. I haven't tried one in 20 years, but it's it's the love of trying lawsuits and the ability to try any type of lawsuit. And like the SEALs, we often parachute in at the 11th hour in cases that have been handled by others for many years. I had a case a couple of years ago where um, I was called six days before trial. It was a big class action where an insurance company was sued by its policyholders for 100 plus million dollars. And it had been handled by a big 1,000 lawyer New York firm for about five or six years. The great news is we came in, you know, we won the case in an important jury trial. But people have asked me, how do you guys do that? How do you at Sussman Godfrey come in? We've come in 48 hours. We won on behalf of Georgia Pacific, 48 hours coming in Friday and trying the case Monday morning. People say, how is that possible? How can you even understand the case, let alone be in a position to actually try the case? And I got to tell you, in the first instance, it's a little, um, it's nerve wracking, it's scary, lots of anxiety for the obvious reason. I mean, you, you know, you're wondering how you are going to get your hands around a case that millions of documents are been produced by the parties, the case going on for five or six or more years. But I'm always reassured by two things. First, that 90% of what happens, you will find out, 90% of what happens before trial never matters in trial, never influences the jury's verdict. Because what they care about is what they actually see in trial and the witness, the live examinations that happen before their very eyes. And so much of what happens in pretrial discovery 
never even makes it into the courtroom. And if it does, it just doesn't impress the jury. And secondly, what I've realized over the years is in any jury trial, there are only two or three issues that ever matter. And so the trick, of course, when you come in in the 11th hour late innings is getting a handle on those couple issues that really do matter and being able to present those in a way that's going to be convincing. I wish I could tell you all that my daily life was as dramatic as a Navy SEAL, but it, it really isn't. There's not a typical day uh, in my life. There are probably three types of typical days I have. I have kind of big event days where I'm in trial or big deposition or a hearing. I have a second type of day where I'm preparing for one of those big events. And third, I have the classic, mild, easy, generally, office days. The big event days are where, you know, I'm 110% focused. And I've, I've always been amazed. I've, I've learned about the human body. Even as a, as a lawyer, I'm blown away by how many, you know, uh, weeks I can go in a row in a trial with sleeping an hour or two a night. It just it demonstrates the resilience of the human body and shows what adrenaline can do. But I also love the peacefulness of, of being in the middle of something like that because I'm in a zone, I shut out the world, and the only thing I'm thinking about is the task at hand. The more stressful days to me, much more stressful, are the days in which you're getting ready for one of those big events. It's just like, you know, in law school, uh, you know, studying for a test because we're all so competitive by nature. What do we do? We overstudy. Most lawyers, if they're good, are always over-preparing for things that never matter at court or never make it into a test. Those are the stressful times. Uh, you know, absorbing as much information as you can. And, you know, for me, it's not thinking about where the win is. I knew that from, you know, the first week of the case. It's how am I going to lose the case and thinking two, three, four, five moves out for everything that might happen in the courtroom. Those are the stressful times. The easy days are those when you're in the office, and most of my office days are filled with conference calls or meetings or hustling business because we don't have a lot of repeat business doing a lot of big cases, kind of bet your company cases. Even the biggest companies in America don't have too many of those cases in their life as a company, so we're kind of like brain surgeons. We don't get so much repeat business. So I got to go hustle business, it's dinners, it's, you know, events, etc. cetera. But uh, I'm just so lucky that my life in Sussman Godfrey has now kind of come full circle and brought me back to where I grew up in New York. I grew up in a little town, uh, Levittown, the first American suburb. And uh, as the crow flies, it's probably 30 miles from where I live and work in Manhattan right now. And being in Manhattan is, is great. I never thought... Um, I'd ever kind of end up there, even though I, I grew up so close. And I love every bit of it. It's certainly there are cities that are more beautiful than New York City, but there's no city on the planet that has its energy, not even close. And I find the work I'm doing now in New York is work that I couldn't even get in Texas. It's the biggest, you know, I'm handling the biggest cases in America, and I just love every bit of it. But I realize that as much as I love New York and what I'm doing now and everything that I've been able to say to you all here today, I couldn't do any of it without TU. I mean, I love Tulsa. I love this place, and the three years here shaped me. And they prepared me to compete against any law grad in any school in America, period. And I go up against guys and girls from Harvard and Yale daily and fare pretty well. The professors here are the very best. And what some of you who haven't yet graduated aren't going to re you don't realize yet is that even after you graduate, they're still here for you. I'm going to see Professor Allison back there. I've talked to so many people after I graduated that I never had as professors, and they've always been so incredibly generous with their time and helpful in every way. And when you look around the room, you realize, you know, for those of you going to school here, these are going to could be your friends for life. For me, it goes double. My wife, Catherine, who's sitting in the back of the room, kind of cringing now. I met Catherine right here, and she's the love of my life. But should we ever, last thing I'm going to say is, should we ever meet as opposing counsel, please don't use anything you may have learned today against me. <laughs>
thank you, everybody. And I'm here to answer any questions you all may have. Well, actually, we do a ton of contingent fee work. I mean, we all have hourly rates at my firm, but I don't work by the hour. I refuse to. Um, and so there are all sorts of fee arrangements geared to align our interests with that of the client. That is, making sure that we don't get paid unless we get them a win. But if we get them a win, we want to get paid a whole lot more than our hourly rate. If we don't get them the win, we get zero. And so they're... They're very creative. There are a lot of hybrid type arrangements. We use them even on the defense side. I mean, that case I was describing in six days notice, it was a situation where the client before trial tried to get the plaintiffs, the class, to take $20 million. The class said, forget it. We come in a week before trial and I quoted the client a, a, a million dollars to go try the case and then 5% of what I save them under a certain benchmark and I didn't know anything about the case, and I said, I said to the client, how much would you really pay right now if you had to? He said 60, as in 60 million. I said, I'd like 5% of what I save you under that. So we went in, won the case big, and so I ended up getting a million dollars plus a $3 million bonus, 5% of the 60 I saved them because the plaintiff's got zero. And on one hand, you think, God, that's outrageous. You're overpaid, Carmody. You got $4 million. The client couldn't be happier because they were fixing to pay $20 million before trial. They were trying to get the plaintiff to take it. They wouldn't. And so the client's happy, we're happy, and we do so many. That's kind of emblematic of so many of the fee arrangements we do. Yes, sir? Well, you parachute in on these cases. It looks like you're doing more defense work now. Both. No, it's about 50-50, I do. About 50-50. Yes, Can you sir. speak a little bit about jury selection? <clears throat> Can I? Sure. <laughs> Whatever you want to say. Well, you know, the example I gave earlier is a kind of a little vignette that really describes a lot of my thoughts about jury selection, which is most lawyers don't appreciate what jury selection is all about, number one. I mean, it's really about trying to strike the screamers, as Bennett Williams said, the great trial lawyer before he died. I mean, jury selection is really a misnomer. You're not selecting anyone. All you're trying to do is identify the crazies and get rid of them <laughs> or cause or, you know, peremptory challenge. I mean, that's what the process is about. But the point that I was trying to make is the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you learn about the people before you and get them to speak. They come in, they don't want to speak. They're nervous. Of course they're nervous. Most lawyers are is just as nervous as the... As the uh, you know, the veneer. And so what happens is most, you know, voir dyers, they, in Texas they call them a voir dyer, in New York it's voir dire, but most of them, they don't, they don't get anywhere. Why? Because the lawyers never really get to find out enough about the people to have an intelligent, to be able to make an intelligent choice whether they strike them or not. The key is figuring out what are the three worst problems in your case. I mean, what's scaring the daylights out of you? and making sure in the jury selection process you're raising the things that just scare the daylights out of you and doing it in a way where you're kind of burying yourself so you're getting them comfortable to speak to and you're getting a little kind of a focus group going where you're getting people to talk about what they think about the issues that really matter to you so you can make an intelligent choice. The thing that most lawyers do wrong is they use it as a kind of another opening statement. I mean, you have plenty of time for opening statement to try to talk about what your case is about, where you're going with it. That's not what the jury selection process is about. Yes, sir. There's so much but politically and in legislators that seem to be aimed at trying to take away people's day in court. Yes. Anti-trial lawyer yes. kind of legislation. Uh, could you comment on that? Because it seems like it's taking away an essential aspect of American freedom, the right to be tried and judged by a jury. Well, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, to, from my practice, access to the courts 
is the single most important thing. I mean, we're on both sides of the docket, but if people can't go to the courts, you know, we can't work in a very selfish way. I mean, it hurts us, but fundamentally, I mean, it's our constitutional rights. And I agree with you, Professor, I mean, I haven't followed all the decisions, but there have been so many and so many, you know, well, without getting there, I don't want to get too political here, but there have been so many decisions, really, that have done just that, that in a, in a sentence, they have really cut down access to the courts, and I think it's a shame. Uh, and that's why I think with, uh, regardless of your politics, with Obama here, he's appointing people that are more likely to, you know, keep the access open. Oswald. Yes. <clears throat> All different names. Uh, yes. <laughs> what do you think of the use of mock juries? There's been a lot written about sure. mock juries, and do you use them? I was one of the very first people who ever used, uh, I mean, when I had, before I joined uh, Sussman, after I left Fulbright, I was kind of kooky and I had to build out these fancy law offices, but they always had a full-size courtroom in the law office themselves. And for years, I sponsored the SMU trial team. But my point of saying all that is we use these courtrooms. They weren't just sitting there and looking pretty. We used them, and we had mock trials about every Saturday. And what now people pay a ton of money to these you know, jury consultants for we would do on our own, have focus groups where you're paying people, you know, a couple hundred bucks. They're coming in for three hours. You're providing them a bag lunch. And what you're doing in a, you know, hour presentation is you're talking without letting them know what side you're on, all about your case. And all you're doing is bouncing ideas off them to figure out what they think and why they think it. Mock trials, of course, are more elaborate than a focus group I kind of describe because in a mock trial, you're actually going through, even though it's abbreviated, if you do it the right way, in my mind, you're actually presenting evidence to the jury. And again, because you're presenting more evidence, your read from the juries are going to be better. It's always a barometer, and I never use them for damages because there's no way in the world you can ever, I've found, kind of replicate the actual trial setting well enough to get any kind of a fair damages read. But what I find them incredibly useful for is a barometer to figure out what a typical person can think and, you know, on the liability side of a case, in any type of case, and then you, you know, figure out what they think and kind of retool accordingly and do it and do it. It's not just one panel. I mean, you'd be crazy to think that one panel should make a difference, but any time you do this, you typically are bringing at least in any mock trial 36 jurors, and then in the deliberation process, you're turning them into three panels. And if you do that process enough times, and sometimes you can take videos of your trial, if you want to do it real inexpensively after the first time you had them live and show that and keep punching it out so you're getting reads from, you know, three more panels or three more panels, and that's when you really learn. But it's an invaluable tool, invaluable. One final question? No, I'm, that's fine. That's <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you. And Bill, you shine a really bright light on this college and for the students who are here. I, I hope you found this as inspirational as I did. Um, and we hope you join us at future alumni. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you.